The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Hear now the word of the Lord as it comes to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them. As an example, and they were written down for our instruction, on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, uh, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. For no temptation has overtaken you, but that is uh, not common to man. Uh, God is faithful. That he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. This morning we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in our long study of the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, We come to one of the most familiar passages in all of 1 Corinthians, the great promise of verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man, and uh, God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, will provide the way of escape also, so that you may be able to stand up under it. It's one of the first verses that I memorized after I became a Christian. And uh, I I loved it. I used it, thinking that uh, essentially what it meant was that God always provides us with a little fireman's pole uh, to escape uh, any temptation that comes our way. It was years before I read the context and I realized that the context lays the foundations for the promise in a way that makes the promise more and more glorious with every passing day. Let's let's wrestle together with the context this morning. Let's pray. Father, I do pray that you would open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things in this your word, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Neil Ferguson, a a great non-Christian historian of our time, has just released a book about the Annus Oriablis, uh, which none of us really want to think about or or uh, reflect upon ever again, the year 2020. It's entitled Doom, The Politics of Catastrophe. In it, he says this, that in times of crisis, it is typically the history that we do not know that we most need. In our day, the problem is a combination of ignorance and arrogance. We don't know what we ought to know and we don't care. Thinking that we know better anyway. It reminds me of a declaration 
a, a generation ago by Richard Weaver. He said, uh, modernism is in essence a provincialism since it declines to look beyond the horizon of the present moment. Those who are in rebellion against memory are cursed to live without knowledge. Over and over again, the Bible exhorts us to remember. It puts a heavy emphasis on historical awareness. It's not at all surprising, considering the fact that the vast proportion of its contents record the dealings of God with men and nations through the ages. So again and again, God calls upon his people to remember. He calls upon them to remember the glories of creation, the devastation of the flood, the judgment of the great apostasies, uh, the miraculous events of exiles and uh, restorations, the anguish of desert wanderings, the grief of the Babylonian deportation, the responsibility of the return to the promised land, that we're to remember the sanctity of the Lord's day, the graciousness of his commandments, and the ultimate victory of the cross. He calls on his people to remember to remember the lives and witnesses of all of those who have gone before us, uh, forefathers and fathers and patriarchs and prophets, of apostles and preachers and martyrs and confessors, evangelists and ascetics, and every righteous spirit made pure in Christ. I- indeed, uh, remembrance and forgetfulness are actually the measuring rods of faithfulness throughout the whole canon of Scripture. That's why uh, the Bible makes it plain that there are only two kinds of people in the world, effectual doers and forgetful hearers. James chapter 1, verse 25. Uh, Michael Morales, a great theologian of our time, uh, reminds us uh, that uh, particularly prominent in the Scriptures is the call to remember the story of the Exodus, which becomes, he says, a kind of overarching paradigm of God's whole plan of eternal eternal redemption in the scriptures. Recollections and echoes of the Exodus run all through the Bible. So, for instance, we come to the Ten Commandments and The Ten Commandments are preceded by the declaration, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The account of Joshua's crossing over the Jordan with the people of Israel is full of elements designed to recall the Red Sea crossing. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Micah, and Habakkuk all frequently cite the redemption of the Exodus as a rebuke to faithless Israel for their lack of gratitude, but but also to encourage uh, God's people in times of exile and affliction with the promise of a deliverance of an Exodus even greater than the first Exodus. So in the Psalms, God reminds Israel of divine rescue. It's a theme that is repeated again and again and again. In Psalm 18, in Psalm 22, in Psalm 25, 31, 43, 60, 68, 71, 78, 80, 81, 83, 105, 107, 114, Uh, which is where Dante gets his whole theme for Dante's Inferno, Psalm 114. 136, 142, 143. I mean, it's everywhere. Over and over again, God says, remember, remember how I rescued my people out of the bondage, uh, rescued them out of slavery, rescued them from Pharaoh, brought them into the promised land. Retellings and allusions to the Exodus story continue in the New Testament. For instance, you remember Stephen's defense 
before the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 7, before he begins to tell us the incarnation, the ministry, the betrayal, and the triumph of the Lord Jesus, he tells the story of the Exodus and its aftermath. Even the vocabulary used to express the saving work of God in Christ is drawn from the Exodus. Uh, Such common New Testament words as redeem and redemption, deliver and deliverance, ransom, purchase, slavery and freedom all enter into the vocabulary of faith through the Exodus. So it's no great surprise that Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul wants to encourage the Corinthian believers to remember, and he uses the story of the Exodus as the means by which he provokes that remembrance. Uh, He says in verse 1, I want you to know. Actually, in the Greek, but it's even stronger than what we can express in English. It's a, it's a sentence placed in the negative. He says, brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant. Brothers, I don't want you to be unaware. I don't want you to be forgetful. And notice, he calls the Corinthians brothers. This is his... A common declaration of his bond with the uh, Corinthian believers. It's covenantal language, uh, which is why uh, he can say a little further in the verse, our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. See the incongruity there? Uh, From a racial perspective, that makes no sense at all. Uh, Those fathers were all Jews. The Corinthians were largely Greeks. And yet Paul says, I, a Jew, call you Greeks my brothers. And uh, we look back at the Jewish patriarchs as our fathers. A beautiful picture of of, uh, covenantal continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then uh, in verses 1 through 4, what he does is he simply reminds them of the Exodus story. He reminds them of the history of the covenant. He reminds them of the redemption story and all the benefits of the covenant that were poured out on the Jews as they escaped from Pharaoh and slavery. That after the Passover... Now, after the escape into the wilderness, now, after the consecration of the firstborn, now, after the feast of unleavened bread, in Exodus chapter 13, God leads his people with a cloud by day and a fire by night. As they journey through the wilderness, uh, they come at long last to Etham and then to Baal Zephon. When Pharaoh determines to pursue them and bring them back or slay them all in the wilderness. According to Exodus chapter 14, at that point, an angel of the Lord, who had been leading them under the cloud by day and the fire by night, turns around and goes to the back of them, between Pharaoh's army and the people. And the cloud itself moves between Pharaoh's army and the people. And that night, the the fire was so bright that it was like the noonday sun. People didn't panic as they huddled on the shore of the sea. The Lord was their defense. And then, according to Exodus chapter 14, they passed through the Red Sea with a wall of water on one side and a wall of water on the other. According to verse 2, all of this means that they were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. In other words, that they were fully enveloped into the promises and the benefits and the joys and the protections 
of the covenant. Verse 3 says that while they were in the wilderness, despite their grumbling, the Lord fed them spiritual food, manna from heaven, while they were in the wilderness of sin. Uh, Exodus chapter 16. In verse 4, they drank a spiritual drink. Exodus 17, when they came to Rephidim and uh, uh, struck the rock of Meribah, which brought forth springs of water. According to verse 5, all of this was under the protection of their rock, their shelter, their fortress, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wants to remind the Corinthians of these incredible covenantal benefits. Every imaginable benefit, rescue, redemption, provision, was poured out on the Jews. Nevertheless, verse 5 says, with most of them, God was not well pleased. And they were overthrown in the wilderness. The situation was that uh, after they'd passed through all of those hazards, all of those dangers, toils, and snares, uh, they came to Kadesh Barnea. They looked over the promised land. There it was before them. So Moses sent out 12 spies, one from each of the 12 tribes. They went into the land and they saw that it was flowing with milk and honey. There were grapes and pomegranates the size of basketballs. But there were also giants in the land. And we're told in Numbers chapter 13 that they came back and said, uh, the sons of the Anakim and the Rephaim are in the land. Now, of course, if they had remembered, remembered their own story, not only of uh, their rescue, their deliverance, their redemption, and their provision, but if they had remembered uh, that Abraham, in Genesis chapter 14, had already overcome the Rephaim and the Anakim and the Zumzim, the Zamzumim, and even the king of Babylon, Chedorlaomer, with just 318 men, they would have been satisfied to enter into their promise, but they feared. Paul says, remember... Remember these things. Verse 6, because these things took place as examples for us. The Greek word that's used here is tupas. It literally means to, uh, to take a hammer and make an impression. It's a word that means mark or pattern or form. But Paul says these things ought to be impressed upon your mind. Uh, They ought to make a dent in your memories. Remember these things. Remember, he says, so that you will not desire evil as they did. Longing for the cucumbers of Egypt as they did in Exodus chapter 14 and 15. These things are to remind us not to be idolatrous as they were, as they they ate and drank and rose up to play in Exodus chapter 32 while Moses was on Mount Sinai, delayed receiving all of the laws and the commandments of God. They made a golden calf and worshiped before it. These things are to remind us not to indulge in immorality, as was the case with the nation of Israel in the time of Balaam in Numbers chapter 24, when they went a whoring after the daughters of Moab. It's to remind us not to put Christ to the test. 
as when the serpents in the desert in Numbers chapter 25 uh, came uh, because the people had given themselves over to the Baal of Peor. It's to remind us uh, not to grumble lest we be destroyed uh, by the destroyer as they were in Numbers chapter 14 and 23,000 fell. Paul says in verse 11, and these things happened to them as an example. It's to put a dent in your memory. Remember these things. And they were written down for our instruction. Paul is saying, learn from this. Elair Belloc has said, uh, time after time, mankind is driven against the rocks of a horrid reality, the horrid reality of a fallen creation. And time after time, mankind must learn the hard lessons of history, the lessons that for some dangerous and awful reason, we can't seem to keep in our collective memory. The historian John Briggs has said, just as a loss of memory in an individual is a psychiatric defect calling for medical treatment, so too any community which has no social memory is suffering from an illness. Is there any wonder why Uh, People in our day are so attracted to madness and folly. They don't know the history of madness and folly. They become a forgetful people. Paul says to the Corinthians, remember and do not forget. These things happened to them as an example and were written down for our instruction. After all, we are the ones upon whom the end of the ages has come. Now, this is not eschatological language. It's soteriological language. In other words, Paul's not talking about the end of history. He's talking about the end of redemption. God's perfect plan is done. The finished work of Christ has accomplished the eternal decrees of God. The fullness of the promises of the covenant have been poured out on us. They saw the Red Sea divided. We have passed through the waters of baptism. They ate the spiritual food of of manna and water in the desert, but we come to the Lord's Supper every single Sunday, and we're reminded the work is done. The, The redemption is accomplished. Jesus has paid the penalty for our sins, and a great double exchange has occurred. Our wickedness is put on him and his righteousness is put on us. Paul says, remember all of this. Verse 12, lest any one of you who thinks that he stands stumbles and falls. He says, take heed. Pay attention. Remember. It's what Peter says when he says, be sober-minded and be watchful. It's what Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians when he says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith. It's what the Lord Jesus himself says to the churches in Revelation chapter 3 when he says, wake up and strengthen what remains. Take heed. Paul ends his exhortation with a word of assurance. He says, in light of all of this, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. In other words, remember all of these examples. Remember how they stumbled and fell so that you won't stumble and fall. Remember how they were able to stand so that you will, in your present circumstances, be able to stand. No temptation has overtaken you that's brand new. That we're we're moderns and so we we think that all of this stuff is new. The gender confusion, the identity stuff, 
uh, the, the critical race theory. None of this is new. If you know the story, you know that the church has faced all of this stuff before with the powerful word of truth that sets men free. That we've faced vast disparities between the rich and the poor before. And the gospel has an answer for that. We have faced the oppression of marginalized people before. We have faced human trafficking before. We've faced child killing before. Do we know the story of how God has led his people through? God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you may be able to stand up under it. In light of that, he simply says in verse 14, therefore flee. Flee from idolatry. The idolatry of the modern world that uh, material things are enough. Uh, The idolatry of of self-deception that says, I know better than anyone else. Paul's message to the Corinthians was simply this. Like our fathers, we've been rescued. Like our fathers, we've passed through the waters of baptism. We've received all of the benefits of the covenant. We've eaten and drunk from his table. So learn from the history of redemption that you might not desire evil, fall into idolatry, succumb to immorality, grumble and rebel against the things of the Lord. Remember. Remember that our God is faithful. Remember that that our God, who has rescued our fathers, will rescue us. I know a lot of Christians who in this day and time are so fretful that they worry about our country. And they should be concerned about our country. They worry about our children. They they should be concerned for our children. But fretfulness, despair, brokenness, that's so contrary to everything that the Lord has taught us. We just sang it a moment ago, didn't we? Uh, Because the Lord our God is good, his mercy is forever sure. His truth at all times firmly stood and shall from age to age endure. The the next time you see a disturbing meme on Facebook, the next time that you, uh, you... Uh, accidentally watch CNN. (laughs) But the the next time there's some new scandal reported on Fox News, sing Psalm 100 to your heart and remember our God is seated upon the throne. He rules and reigns. The kingdoms of this world are the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ Thanks be to God. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.